because I want to, I want to let you know uh, how productive, how productive a poet he is. He is an internationally known and widely published Detroit poet. Uh, he's also a, a university uh, professor, or literary arts activist, and an arts organizer. He was named the 2017-18 Murray Jackson Scholar in the Arts um, at Wayne State University. Um, he is the author of 15 books and uh, chapbooks, including the award-winning Wide Awake in Someone Else's Dream, published in 2008 by Wayne State University's Press. And that features featured poet, poems written about Russia, Israel, Germany, Alaska, and Detroit. Wide Awake won both the Patterson Poet Prize for Literary Excellence and the American Indie Book Award in 2009. In 2005, he was named since Clear Shore's um, first uh, poet laureate, that's his hometown. He has read and performed his work in Afghanistan, Israel, Pakistan, um, Palestine, Russia, China, France, UK, Italy, Germany, Spain, Finland, and most of the 50 states in our union. He has taught English, uh, creative writing, American studies, labor studies, and world literature at Wayne State University since 1980. Uh, he and I came to Wayne at the same time. Uh, and he is the founding director of both the National Writers' Voice Project in Detroit and the Springfed Arts, um, Metro Detroit Writers' Literary Arts Organization. He was selected as the best Detroit poet by the Detroit Free Press and the Detroit Metro Times, and is the nation's first ever artist in residence for a public library at the Chelsea District Library for 2008-2009. In 2010, he received the Barnes and Nobles Poets and Writers for Writers Award with Maxine Hung, um, Kingston, and Jano Dias. In 2011, his brown-breaking anthology, A Working Words, Punching the Clock and Kicking Out the Gems, uh, was given the 2011 uh, Library of a Mission and Notable Book Award. In 2017, he received two Library of Michigan Notable uh, Book Awards for both his new collection of po poems entitled, I Want to Be Once and For Heaven Was Detroit, an anthology of Detroit music essays from jazz to hip hop. Um, uh, he was the editor for, for that. And then there was another um, anthology entitled um, Bob Seeger's House, an anthology of Michigan short stories for which he was a co-editor. Both Heaven in for Detroit and Bob Seeger's are finalists for the prestigious Forward Book Awards and forthcoming recordings and value uh, include poetry score, M.L. Lieber and Al Cooper and King by Liebler and Steve Evans. So, so I'll just stop there to let <laughs> you know that you are in the presence of a very busy um, uh, poet. And I have to be thankful to him for his involvement in the Humanities Center. He's currently a resident scholar in the Humanities Center and this is his third stint. He started in 2000 and 2003. Uh, he was resident scholar and his work then was on visions of words, literary programs for non-traditional uh, venues. And then in 2015, 2016, he was a resident scholar working on Heavens Was Detroit, uh, essays on Detroit music from jazz to hip hop and beyond. And he's also participated in our Brangbag, 
talks. This is uh, his uh, sixth Brungbach talk, and he was a participant in our working groups program. So thank you, ML, for your involvement in our work. And he has been a firm, firm friend of the center and also a personal friend. So I say with uh, great honesty and authenticity that uh, I welcome my friend and colleague to the virtual podium. His talk, as I said earlier, is going to be on Hong Dog, a poet's memoir of rock, revolution, and redemption. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. It's always a pleasure to see you um, and all my friends out there. Um, thank you guys for coming. Now, Jerry and Chris Tish are in the house, so now I'm really nervous about reading my stuff. I'm kidding. Also, I just want to mention, because I'll be swigging from this, this is not a bottle of Jack Daniels. Sometimes <laughs> people have said, are you drinking Jack Daniels? And it's, no, I don't drink. So anyway, uh, the the memoir is I'm finishing uh, the draft of it, um, sort of prepping it in the near future, hopefully for publication. Um, it's entitled Hound Dog, uh, a, a poet's memoir of rock revolution and redemption. Um, and basically, I do, it's going to be not a super thick, um, not a super thick uh, memoir. I'd like it to be uh, like as short as a Woody Allen movie, uh, you know, 80 minutes or so uh, per se, because I might get bored too with it. So it's, it's in about 10 or 11 chapters. And the way that I sort of constructed the, the book is uh, by titling each chapter after a musical, either influence and or friend. And then using that as a springboard to talk about whatever, uh, whatever the section is about. So uh, the, the first chapter, uh, and this, this record that's behind me is actually uh, part of the uh, part of a big part of the story, especially chapter one, which is called Elvis. Um, and that's the story about how my grandmother, uh, maybe that's what happened to me, Walter. My grandmother turned me on to Elvis when I was four and uh, changed my life. So uh, thank you, Grandma. And Grandma appears quite a bit in the memoir, uh, a little bit today uh, in the section I'm going, to, I'm going to share. So there's Elvis, Beatles, Dylan, um, and then folks that I you know, recorded or worked with, uh, Al Cooper and Country Joe and... Um, and it ends with a chapter on Eminem. And I'll just say this, the first line is, I never met him, but dot, 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 you can fill in the rest there. But it's, uh, it's really a chapter about uh, working out of that studio and with uh, Steve King, the great late producer of uh, Eminem's material. So I'm going to share a section. This is a kind of a typical section. I, it seems longer to me, but it's only really eight pages, uh, double space. So um, it's, it's, it was a story from the past that I, I fine tuned for the memoir, which any story that I've done has been about my own life, my own experiences. Um, this one is called Neil Young, uh, tentatively. Uh, and the re I was in a workshop in Massachusetts or in Maine over uh, the last semester, and one of the, the younger people in the um, memoir after reading this piece asked me which, which kid was Neil Young. Um, now that may just mean it's a younger uh, audience there, but Neil Young is not in the story, I, I'm sorry to say, other than uh, something that he's connected to. So it's called Neil Young and the, the epigraph is Tin Soldiers and Nixon's Coming. After the invasion of Cambodia, I gave up baseball for a few years. I somewhat regret that now because I love the game so much, but I could no longer support anything American after that. The 60s were rough on us all, from the older neighborhood boys who were asked to serve in Vietnam to the kids in the baseball fields and mudlots of America, 
Sacrifices were made by all in one way or another. In a way, it was my cultural sacrifice, not the kind of sugar and gas that our parents and grandparents were familiar with. For me, American ways and traditions had to go. Cambodia and Kent State was the end, the limit, the close of my youth. I gave up apple pie, baseball, but I couldn't give up grandma. I wanted to, but she had made such a strong impression on me with her constant reminder to give her a kiss before I left the house because she was older and might not be there alive when I came back. My God, after hearing this throughout my childhood, I couldn't toss her out with the mitt and hostess fruit pies, not without worrying about carrying her death on my shoulders late into my midlife when I should be filled with other problems and other crises, like my hair turning gray, falling out, my wife ending menstruation and bitching at me will both have hot flashes and I, damn it, I will also have my grandmother's ghost screaming at me, you SOB, her favorite initials. You gave me up with baseball and, and hostess fruit pies. I told you to always kiss me before you left the house. But this damn Nixon and this Cambodian deal, you son of a bitch, you stopped. And understand this, young man, your grandfather is upset too. I guessed he would be. Who would pull him around by that ring in his nose? Well, I couldn't live with that. So I kept grandma close and I still do. But this story is only partially about that. It really is about life after Cambodia and Kent State. This is a story about hippie days and baseball. Before the hippies, there was only baseball, lots of it. Baseball from morning till dusk. If there was enough light to see that little round, usually electrical taped mass, there was baseball. I remember days so hot that the grasshoppers would fry when they leapt upon the piece of old car hood we used as a backstop, but we still played baseball. Once we played for so long in the hot sun that I was sick for a week, but the whole week I dreamt about Roger Maris, Mickey Mantle, Al Kaline, Willie Mays, and Hank Gary. My grandmother kept me in a dark room with a fan blowing. She said her brother Andy once had sunstroke from too much baseball and hot sun. I laid in bed worried sick, wondering if what my great grandpa died from was a sunstroke or a heart attack. I'd heard both things mentioned in the same breath with my dead great grandfather's name. After the sun left my brain, as my grandma put it, I was back in the field playing baseball. Now, this was all several years before I played in the school league and illegally in the Catholic little league because I wasn't Catholic at the time. I even started going back to the Lutheran church to play in their church league. Now, I want to say this at this point, that what we played was hardball. We took a hell of a lot of pride in playing anything with the word hard in it. We were giggly kids and hardball meant something more exciting than softball. Hardballs were what we played with. Those sissy kids, square kids played base, played softball. This was Kenny Ensroth's favorite joke. I promised him I would use it in a story if I became a writer. I'm a writer, that's for you, Kenny. Now, this point might seem minor, but really it was the beginning of the division between the cool kid baseball players and the goofy kid baseball players. This was also representative of the division that was taking place in the country, and some people think that life is not symbolic. That's from my college professor who said I didn't know a symbol from a tit. I told him that if I ever became a writer, I'd expose his ass in a story. I'm a writer, you're exposed. Anyway, the division probably became more noticeable when we started selling records, stealing records from the local SS Kresge store. We figured that there were all kinds of groovy records by Hendrix and Cream, Grateful Dead, Jefferson Airplane, and these guys running the store didn't know shit about new hip culture. So we figured it was better for us to have them than for the capitalist pigs to sell them. We just started hearing about this capitalism and the mess it had created from the new underground radio station. It didn't sound cool. The radio was always talking about capitalism and the older folks' generation. Well, I had a whole family of sorry ass people to prove that it must be a sick system from Uncle Andy to Aunt Harriet. My family, I hope they don't sue me uh, when the book comes out. Uh, 
My family was a bunch of a, a sorry ass group. I wanted their love. They gave me their money. I understood the underground message. So we kept ripping the dime store off. We listened to these new records while the other kids, the softball kids, listened to watered down uh, mid 60s British invasion, kind of like do the Freddy and stuff. That figured a day late and a dollar short. That was my grandma I used to whisper about some of those kids. She also in hushed tones because she was friends with their parents told me if I ever mentioned this in public, she'd tear my heart out because I'd break hers. What she meant was that she would be embarrassed because she had made public her innermost feelings. I learned about this shit too after Kent State. Anyway, the division began then and spread throughout the 60s. In early spring of 1970, between the last Jimi Hendrix album appropriately titled Cry of Love, the last Cream record appropriately titled Goodbye, and spring training, several of us happened upon the softball kids in a mud lot across from a field where we smoked most of our pot. Maybe we were smoking that day, maybe not. That's a documented side effect from hemp. But there they were, and there we were, standing in the warm spring air with wide bell bottoms, Levi jackets with patches sewn on that proclaim things like Woodstock, peace, power to the people. And everybody had one of those little Rolling Stone lip and tongue patches sewn on. So we walked up to these kids and we asked them if they'd like to play a game of ball. These short-haired, yellow-bellied sons of Tricky Dicky, as Lennon called their type, just smirked. And the pudgy one, whose hair was as short as mine was long, said, with you guys, we'd kill you. And by all logical reasoning, they should have. We smoked too much dope, read too much Che, listened to too much Morrison, and tried too much to get in touch with our spiritual selves through modern chemistry to win a simple game of baseball. But my brother spoke up and said, come on, you little Bo Peeps. What are you afraid of? You afraid to play with a hard ball? We laughed hard. It's still got a giggle from us, no matter how hip we were. We may have been hip, but we were totally mature. The one totally immature, the one greaser in our group perked up. He was always into this talk about genitals and motorcycles. In fact, he wore his leather jacket throughout the summer. He said, only a man could stand it. And we thought only a dickhead would even try it. He should have been in the other group when the division came, but he smoked cigarettes and they wouldn't have. Them. These guys were hard line Brady Bunch types. One even had a nose like Alice's, but that's another story. So the greaser, whose last name was Forge, again, I thought that was symbolic, said, come on, you chicken shits, play us a game. The losers get the shit beat out of them. I looked at my friend Jeff and he looked at me wrinkling his nose at Forge. And I said, no, I want to play for something worth something. You might be a greaser, Forge, but we're hippies. We don't beat no shit out of no people, you asshole. Let's play for a joint. The softball kids looked at each other. Then the one with the slightly crossed eyes and hair lips said, Oh, forget you guys. All you do is talk revolution and dicks. Is that supposed to be a put down? If we lose, we get your joint. And he grabbed himself between the legs. I immediately went into my best negotiating voice while laughing to myself. No, 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 no. You don't understand. I mean, a smokable joint, you know, pot, grass, blow, weed, marijuana, you know, they turned red and the youngest toehead blonde whimpered, we ain't never done that before. We don't smoke that stuff. I quickly realized my mistake and I said, oh, oh, okay. How about if you lose, you guys buy us all a hostess fruit pie. Now they could get with that. Okay, the toehead said, and the hair lip kid seconded it. Then from the back of the group came the voice of hidden authority. You know, the kid who looks like a Marine. You know, the kid whose brother signed up and wasn't drafted for Vietnam. The kid whose dad's first name was Carol and his best friend, Denny. Denny's dad was Shirley. These are, this is true. Of course, the softball kids would have fathers with names like that. You can't make this up. Anyway, the kid says, you guys can't play baseball with beetle boots and bell bottoms. 
Well, that really pissed off the greaser Forge, who had heretofore been rather quiet. He said, listen, you motherfuckers, don't ever wear, don't, I don't wear no tennis shoes. They make my feet stink, and I don't want my effing feet stinking. And when I go to my effing chick's house, now, if you ain't got no effing chick to care about your effing feet, then don't effing tell me not to wear effing beetle boots and bell bottoms to play this here effing game. You bastards are so worried about effing balls, baseballs, footballs, basketballs. Why don't you get some balls and stand up for what you believe in? I could tell the greaser was going over the deep end. He was never political, but he did have an element of some kind of politics in his voice that day. Still, his, en still his ending confused the hell out of me. However, the softball boys must have understood because they shut up and we played. We actually did pretty well. We scored a lot of runs and Forge, out of his rage and anger, hit every pitch over Mr. Standish's fence for a home run. I, as everyone learned that day, how important clean smelling feet were to him. No one ever remarked about the greaser's old beetle boots again. In fact, the last I heard he was still wearing them into the 21st century. Anyway, we won and that really pissed those kids off. We ate the fruit pies and talked about all of our baseball memories, which were some of our most important childhood memories. In fact, those were the deepest memories that the effing war in Southeast Asia was eroding from our mind. And then in May of that spring, wham, Kent State. Kent State meant the invasion of Cambodia. I learned about that later too. I heard about the killings in my political science class in high school. It stunned me. The teacher walked in pale and he said, four college students were just shot in Ohio. I was angry and I flipped out. All the philosophy and all the pot in the world wouldn't bring these kids back. And then the memory of the neighborhood boy, the one who had signed up for the Marines, we, was killed in action in December 1965. It all flooded back. And the division grew in the world and in my heart. And I, gave up baseball and apple pie. I could have given up grandma, but she quickly changed her position on the war after Kent State. There was hope of healing, but I still can't move, remove the pain of Kent State, even now, more than 50 years later. I went to the campus for the 20th anniversary of the May 4th killings. My lifelong pal, Jeff, traveled with me in 1990. That was a day of speeches, a march along the route the students took the day while being chased by the uh, Ohio National Guard and a, and a poetry reading that featured some of America's best known poets. Everyone sat and listened to each other at Brady's Cafe, a longtime traditional hangout at Kent. I spotted the great American poet Alicia Ostriker in the audience. She approached me after I read to tell me how she appreciated both my poem and my coming down from Detroit. It was, it was literary, it was a literary Elvis moment for me. I knew her mother daughter poems about the Vietnam War, and I met several very special people that day who became lifelong friends. Maggie Smith, the wonderfully warm and kind Nage Reagan, his buddy from Cleveland, Daniel Thomas, Larry Smith, who's, um, and, and Daniel Thompson's book, Famous in the Neighborhood. These folks eventually made me an honorary citizen of Kent. A few years later, chapter nine of the Vietnam Veterans of America in Detroit made me an honorary member of their organization by gifting me with a beautiful silk baseball jacket with my name on the front. Since 1990, I have made many trips to Kent State. I have taken my Wayne State students in my Vietnam War through literature class there for a walkthrough and discussion. And I still feel wounded and heavy with sadness when I stand where Jeffrey Miller was shot and his blood ran down the curb. And I still see their 1970 class photos where they're looking more like high school pictures of Jeffrey Miller, Sandra Schur, Allison Krauss, and Bill Schroeder, as if they were my own family members. Elvis, Beatles, Dylan, Vietnam, and Kent State were major turning points for me that I shall never forget. That's it.
Thank you. Thanks. So um, I guess I can try to answer questions. People are writing stuff in here. Michael, Michael Madigan, my friend, says that he hopes it will be released as an audio book. <laughs> well, maybe. Who knows? Um, so what questions do we have? Do we have uh, or if comments? You would like to, yeah, if you would like to ask a question, um, you can raise your hand by pushing the reaction button. And then um, it should say raise hand. Or any comments. Or comments, yeah. You want me to read the whole book? <laughs> so I guess maybe one question is, you know, the, oh, Diane DeSilla says her hand raised. Yes, Diane DeSilla. No, I just want to say what a, I, and I wrote this in the comment, you're such a good storyteller. I love the way you call people out and um, the weaving of history with your personal life, I find very appealing. So I can't wait to read the whole book. And I agree with Michael, it should be an audio book. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you. Uh, and thanks for those comments. Um, I thought of something when you were when you were mentioning um, the the storytelling. Yeah, I think one of the things in in the way that I write. Oh, I was thinking Jim Daniels read the whole book. I mean, in its rough stage, and one of his comments was, "I don't know. It sounds exactly like you." So um, that that was a, a good comment. I like that comment because that's what I wanted. I wanted to have a. I wanted to feel, you know realistic and honest and true and because it is you know yeah. somebody else step right up yes jerry brother <laughs> for thank you for this reading um here's my question if you were going to make a soundtrack for this thing have you thought about that at all because oh, when you totally. were reading, I kept thinking, oh, there's this song and this song and this song. I had a, a DJ playing in my imagination the whole time you were reading along. Maybe you should release a, a, you know, a recording to go with this thing. You think so? <laughs> yeah, no, I think, I mean, you have a really good point there. Um, one of the ideas, and we actually tried this uh, the year that I had that Murray Jackson, you know, you put on a presentation. And I had... Um, Ted Nagy joined me and Frankie the K and I think Lou too on drums. Um, and we sort of did the, the 1967 chapter, which is Jimi Hendrix. And we kind of laced it with various Hendrix songs along the way. So the idea is, is eventually the book can be done in reading form like that and have the music behind it. And probably I will make a playlist as I've done for respect and heaven was Detroit, but you're right. It's, I, I was thinking of that even doing this reading, but I know sometimes it's really hard on zoom to layer stuff. Well, again, thanks for a great reading and, and I'll wait for the book, but I'll also be staying tuned for the recording. All Maybe right. Time, even you think. <laughs> and Jerry was there uh, in the early part of some of this stuff with some of these guys I grew up with. Uh, who are still alive and well. So uh, brother is still hanging out there and still <laughs> hanging in. It was good to see him back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's back. Thanks. Thanks, dear. Somebody else? Carolyn, what do you want to know? What do you want to know about me? I was wondering uh, in writing, you know, chapters, particularly ones that kind of go back to the neighborhood and you do such a great job of like creating the them on the page. Uh, did you did you find that the writing of your memoir ended up getting you back in touch with people that you had perhaps long been out of touch with? Just curious. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a really good question with that. I know writing it, you know, took me back to a, a time where there were, you know, there were some uh, fun and good things um, definitely that took place. I mean, I, I am very grateful for my life, but um, but some of it was dredging up, you know, because each chapter goes through different parts. 
I mean, there's a chapter on sort of being a, a house husband and, and raising my kids, especially during the summer months with our profession, um, that I think is pretty funny. Um, and then there's, uh, there's growing up with the Beatles. A lot of you have heard my Beatles story, and I've done that with it. I've, I've taken that story that I wrote back in 84 uh, and first read at Wayne State in our little colloquium. I took that, um, uh, that story and inserted about 27 Beatles songs into it and then got musicians and it's become quite a choreographed uh, show of music with uh, a video of a screen behind us with images that go along with it. And um, so that, that's something that, that can be done with some of these and, uh, but, I'd have to really think about um, going back in touch with stuff. I know one, I can tell one funny story that uh, I was doing a book signing from heaven was Detroit. <laughs> and this guy came up to me around here. I, I live and have always lived in St. Clair Shores. And I was at the library um, in, in St. Clair Shores and the kid came up to get his book signed. Or he, he's not a kid anymore. But he said, do you remember me? And I said, no, nah, not really. And then he took his glasses off. He goes, I'm Bobby. I'm Bobby, dude. And, you know, we were friends when you were five. I said, Bobby, look at us. Taking your glasses off isn't doing anything uh, to help me here. <laughs> but that's one thing I can tell you. So that got me back in touch with Bobby for a, a minute. <laughs> ML, there's a question in the, a comment in the chat of, from Jeremy Peters. He says that my pre-academic career was music licensing and he'd be happy to help you with rights and with the recordings. Oh, wow. Well, that's, that's really good. I'm just reaching down for my little, <laughs> this is my dog, Stella McCartney. She's getting a little antsy here. Um, yeah, well, you know what, Jeremy, just, uh, you know, send me a, uh, an email and touch base like that, because I've, that's another part of different chapters in here. I have, uh, people know that I've done uh, the poetry book of poems about Detroit music and included several lyrics that I thought were, um, you know, were appropriate to fit that theme. Um, by a number of people, Fats Domino, um, Robbie Robertson, Paul Simon, there's a bunch of folks. Um, and um, I did it also with uh, the Working Words book, uh, Bob Dylan was in it. And so in the Bob Dylan chapter, there's definitely mention of, of that experience and so forth. But uh, the Dylan, the Dylan quick story was I wanted to have them in that book. I wanted some poems. I really just wanted Woody Guthrie's uh, final words to Woody Guthrie that were on the back of one of his albums. And um, so I know I knew someone who was a friend of his and the friend must have told him uh, to call me. So his music licensing guy, uh, uh, Joel Rosen, uh, called me and he said, yeah, Bob said you can have anything you want for free. And I said, what? <laughs> you know, and he goes, yeah, what do you want? And I said, well, I really want the last words of Gu Woody Guthrie, whatever the formal title of that is. And he goes, is that it? And I was actually at my desk at Wayne State when we used to have telephones. And, um, you know, and I said, I had to think real quick. I said, oh, yeah, can I have uh, the death of Hattie Carroll? And yeah, sure, sure. Bob said anything you want. So that's a little bit of my experience with Bob Dylan. He hasn't come over for dinner yet lately though. Uh, let's see. So there, there are people with hands raised. Why don't you unmute hand raised people and let's. Hi, it's me, Susan Messer. Yeah, Susan. <laughs> you know, I was I just thinking about you the other day. I was. You what? I, I was thinking about you. Oh, 
Wow. I wondered if what you were up to. In, in well, now I, I just am so glad to hear you. I don't think I've ever heard you read your own work before. I've mm. known you only as a supporter of the work of others, including mine. And I just want to say what a, in addition to everything on ML's list of credits, he's such a supporter of other artists and um, writers. So uh, anyway, I, I love the reading. It was so fresh. I don't have any questions. I just wanted to say, I, you know, it is, it's, it's so fresh. It just feels like it's just um, unleashing everything and such a wonderful mix of pain and joy and youth and age and that whole idea of giving up baseball because of these world events it was just beautiful and i'm so okay. glad that william colburn told me about this event i wouldn't have known otherwise. oh fabulous well i'm glad to see you because uh susan messer wrote a great uh, novel uh entitled um tele i want to say grand river and joy grand river and joy yeah. <laughs> did i get it right you did <laughs> yeah and i was thinking about that that novel i've used it in my detroit classes and folks might want to pick that up u of m published it uh and it's it's really it, it totally gets into the 67 situation the grandy ballroom uh, it's it's got a lot of layers in it too oh, thank you Thanks. thank you so check that's that not out. why i came here today i came here no today. i know but i now and I, i'm so I, glad i did and, yeah. and can you see John Lennon there behind me? I do I see John. Are you kidding? Yeah. <laughs> so you I, take care of yourself. Okay, and thank keep writing. you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Good to see you. Um, someone else's hand is raised. Four participants with raise. I can't see the hand raises. Anybody know? Are they waiting for me to call on them? Wait, I just saw a hand go up. I, it won't let me oh. unmute. You You're want unmuted. to you're unmuted. You can okay. talk. Hey, ML. Yes. I just want to tell you, you, to me, the, the sign of a good book is when you want to hear more, like a good song or a good movie. Congrats. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lou. Lou's uh, one of my drummers. He drums in the Beatle show and, um, and in what we're doing now as a, a side thing. So thanks, Lou. Appreciate sure, it. Sure, man. Andrea, did you have a question? It's like a silent movie. You got to unmute. Andrea, unmute. Now I can. Now we go. Hi. Hi. Um, you know, your stories are remarkable. And, you know, having worked with young adults my whole life, I think is, you know, the stories like Kent State coming from somebody like you who had such a firsthand experience instead of them just reading a blurb in a history book is so pertinent, especially right now while our country is going through so much turbulence for young people to understand. We've been down some of these roads before and it's important to pay attention and maybe make sure these things don't happen again. I know that Kent State was a major chapter in teaching history and the kids did respond strong to it for which I'm grateful. But these stories coming from you are so important. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Very kind. Um, ML. Yes. I think I'm, I'm a next in the queue here. So go ahead. Uh, I love you? the queue. <laughs> Shouting out from uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. I just want, we're coming up. ML and I are coming up on our 40th anniversary of, of meeting. I was a student of his at Wayne State close to 40 years ago. And immediately um, my, my teacher, my professor became uh, one of my best friends and I've held him and his wife and his family hostage for close to 40 years now <laughs> of being my besties and traveling. And ML changed my life, opened up my life, taught me so much, shared so much, boosted me, uplifted me um, along the way. And he's still today, he's my brother, he's my uh, my guru, he's my replacement uh, father um, and guide and best friend. And uh, I'm just so excited you're getting the memoir down. Once you said I'm working on the memoir, I'm like, let's go, let's go. Uh, I'm, I, I want this as an audio book. Um, I'm your, one of your biggest groupies and fans. And um, all I can say is no pressure but there's more than one memoir in you. So, you know, just keep rolling. Oh, no, I know, I know. But 
<laughs> once I do this, this, this was kind of hard uh, going back through a lot of this. When you, when you, I mean, there's not anything, well, it depends. I guess shocking is relevant uh, to folks, but um, you know, there, it, there's a lot of, I mean, I wanted to tell the truth about everything. So, um, and, 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 and be clear about that in it and not to kind of gloss over stuff. So it really, while it might seem just in this little talk, like, oh, this is a book where uh, ML Liebler drops names. It, it's really not that. It's, I've just been really fortunate to be able to have contact and work with a lot of, uh, a lot of my heroes. I mean, what can I say? It's as bizarre to me as it may sound to someone else um, to be friends and, and good friends with a lot of these people. Um, anyway, so thank you, Lisa. That was very kind. That was kind. Thanks, Lisa. And I'll see you in England. We're all going to England in March. So I'm I'm a crown. Hey, okay. ML, can you yes, just Linda? Linda. Um, I also wanted to say how much I loved how you described your buddies. There was so much really love and empathy. And you were saying, you were mentioning the names, you were saying, oh, I hope, you know, so-and-so doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't sue me. All of it was done with so much really care. And, you know, we, we all know people from our past, you know, kids that we grew up with, you know, the, the names that, that stay with us and just like forge the greaser or the guy who looked like a Marine before he was a Marine. I loved that part of the reading um, as much as the historical significance of Kent State was the significance of the heart that you brought to these characters that, um, you know, that enriched the story. And I just love that. I really, really admire that a lot. Well, thanks Linda, I appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Isaac Pickell um, asked me a question. I've always wanted to ask you that and I hope the poet, poetics of memory inspiring influence new poets in their writing and maybe more importantly, their lives. Um, I'm not sure, are you out there, Isaac? You see how I fashioned your last name now? I made, I'm making you famous. I, I I heard that you know it's been it's been a long is it, time isn't it pickle that dawned on me it's not pickle is it no it's not because <laughs> you can't make that up but what were you asking anyway I, I'm just you know every all of the not only the poetry you write but now um, sort of this uh, prose work it always seems like you're reaching back to sort of like find something for the future rather than just remembering. Uh, for the sake of remembering. And, you know, I wanted to follow that hunch and see sort of how you envision that process working um, and uh, sort of what your hopes were for um, younger people reading uh, your work or hearing your work. Well, that's, a, that's good. Um, well, for young people reading it, I think what Andrea said would be the ultimate if they can pick up a little bit of personal uh, or a little history through personal stories, American history. Um, but I, I, I still like to connect everything. I mean, I, I teach and operate under the Marvin Gayism. Everything is everything, and I do think everything connects, um, and and in ways. I mean, sometimes you know you might have to go out a bit to 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 connect it. But I'm always looking at that sort of thing. How, how does this connect? Uh, like one of the questions, and I don't know if I've answered it. I don't think I have. But overall, I've been asking myself, okay, so what is, what is the overall theme of this memoir? If, if I'm teaching it like I teach people's books and stories and poems, you know, in other words, what, what's going on here? What, what's the big story? What's the big theme? I don't, I don't have an answer to that. I'm going to keep thinking of it. Maybe there is no answer to it. Maybe it's like a Zen Cohen. There's no right or wrong answer. It's just there. Um, but anyway, so yeah, what Andrea said, I think is, would be the ultimate because people can get a little history from personal stories. American history, because it's not really taught anymore. And um, 
or was it ever? I don't know. Hello. Somebody in? Hello, ML. Yeah. Hey. I one of my early it. publishers. Yes, sir. And one of mine, too. Yeah. But I appreciated your handling of Kent State. I was at Kent State, both my wife and I, in 1970. Mm. And I've tried to write about it, and it seems you just can't put it down. And it is fragmented, and it is deep. And you captured that. And mentioning uh, Neil Young was appropriate, too. That song, Four Dead in Ohio, just always brings back that deep uh, feeling of that time. And you know, you're a great poet and a performer and uh, that's coming across and it's coming oh. across in the prose too, I hope so. Oh, thanks, thanks. Wish you the best, man. Thank you, Larry, it's so good to see you. I, you know, I was thinking about Larry too because something I, oh, it might've been that Afterlife uh, series, the new season, but there's a scene towards the end where they're all on a carousel going around all the characters and Larry had uh, the magic poetry band down to um, Sandusky, Ohio. And it was a, the, the, the most interesting and fun reading ever. We would yeah. have a couple of poets who would read and then a bell would ring and everybody would jump back on a carousel. It was like a carousel museum. That's right. Is that still there, Larry? The, the carousel museum is still there. Yeah. Wow. That, wasn't that a wild night? That was great. That was great. <laughs> you belong on a carousel. <laughs> it was just so cool, man. It's like, yeah. read some poems, ding, ding, ding. Everybody jumps on the carousel. Get off, read some more poems. Great, yeah. great idea. I'll have to buy a carousel so we can make that happen in Detroit. Uh, let's see. Katie. Katie Sanders. Katie! ML! Hey, there you are. Here I am. You can so good to see you. You're an you are you are a, a rock. What is this? God, what are, a rock God this poem. is your life with Ralph Edwards or what? Oh, go ahead. It go is ahead. your life. Yeah, probably. Yeah, that's so true. Oh my god. I well, I have two. I'll be quick. I because I know I can just send you a text anytime, but um do you have well, two quick ones. Do you have a time frame for publication? And like when can I get my 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 hands on this and then also um is prison in there you knew i had to ask the question is there is there a prison story or a fielding story or some kind of related or an attica oh, story or something related you know there there could be now that you're mentioning that yeah um, i want to throw a wrench if there's not there's not because there's no 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 there, but. no but that's important i know i've been to jail for justice a few times um <laughs> If, if that's mentioned in there, but, uh, mm -hmm. but no one brought me a writing program, but um, Katie, Katie and I, Katie worked with me and Jason Schinder at the national writer's voice, which is a very important part of my life. And, um, and she became a, a prison uh, teacher and an activist for prison writing and, and, um, Mm -hmm. you know for people who are incarcerated are, are you still doing that i imagine mm -hmm. you are right yep so katie started that and um and i've done a fair amount of that too but we had a mutual friend some of the people that are online here probably have heard of fielding dawson mm -hmm. um and he became a friend of mine and he was a friend uh to katie because of her research and then another friend was Minnie Bruce Pratt, who became and is a friend, a really good friend of mine still. And um, and so she did great work and writing and research. And you got your PhD in that, didn't you, Katie? Mm hmm Yeah. So and I took over for Janine and um, Fielding. Oh. I there took over for them also at Sing Sing. So oh. So our yeah. yeah, so our paths have crossed. We've we've got multiple threads that we've sewn together, you and I, over many years. I know, I know. I can remember us boxing <laughs> Everything's stuff up. connected. <laughs> Bo boxing things up, yeah, right. And racing over the George Washington Bridge to the Patter not Patterson, but uh, what is that, what is that thing? The famous reading series over there in in New Jersey. In Patterson? No, in New oh, Jersey. Dodge. You know, Dodge, Dodge driving. Yeah. Yeah up and down uh, 80 yeah. to the Dodge. Um, yeah, well, gosh, it's good to see you. Thank so you good to see you. Thank you, thanks.
And, and plus, we were in Northern California teaching people how to start writers' voices, which was a trip too. Uh, anyway, somebody else? I'm just looking at the questions. Hmm. Apparently not. So, <laughs> so, so ML, I think that uh, Jackie will have a little speech uh, to give you. But one of the things I want to tell you about is that there is a there is David Marola. He is a sociologist. He's now the chair of sociology, in fact. Uh, he went to Kent State, and and that that experience at, at Kent State has shaped his entire academic life. He is very strong on social justice. He's an extremely um, personable young man. So, if you're ever looking for a friend at Wayne who who has the Kent State connection, mm. you might uh, contact David Marola. Okay, that's great. Great yeah. tip. Great tip. Well, I want to thank everyone too for, you know, and I, I didn't mean for this and, and didn't want it, this to turn into ML Liebler, this is your life. I appreciate all the kind comments. Um, you know, of course, it's wonderful. Um, and it's, but it's better to see everybody, you know, uh, and see some people I haven't seen in a while. Uh, like, like Lisa, who was my student 40 years ago, she, she hasn't changed. What, look at me. I didn't look like this then, Lisa. I had long, dark. No, I didn't. <laughs> anyway, thank you, guys. Back to you, Walter or Jacqueline. Hi, thank you, everyone, for attending this talk. And thank you, ML. Thank you so much for that wonderful story. And honestly, I think I speak for all of us uh, to say we're all excited for you to release the work and when you do. Um, the Humanity Center did. Uh, wanted to honor you and thank you um, for giving this talk, but also working with us for so many years um, with this journal with our logo on it, as well as like a caddy, you can keep all of your um, writing tools in. Oh, um, cool. Yes. And yeah. so this talk will actually, it was actually recorded and will be edited and put up on our YouTube shortly. Um, and you can keep updated with all of our past talks and upcoming talks there, as well as our website. Um, yeah, I wanted to mention, Jacqueline and Walter, that there's a lot of people on here who don't even know about, I don't think, this series. There's a lot who do, but uh, for those who don't, there's usually a couple of talks a week, and they've been on Zoom. Some of them are live and, uh, or were live. Uh, and I think this link works pretty much for all of them. Jacqueline, is that true? Do you guys do yeah. a new link every time or no? No, it's the same. It's the same passcode and um, link for every talk for the 2021-22 school year. Good, good. You should check it out because there's a lot of cool talks that uh, I've learned a lot being connected with the Humanity Center. And I'm happy about that. Grateful. Yeah, okay. so we'd love to see you all again. Thanks. So thank you so much for attending today. And Thank you. See you next time. Bye-bye.